or today's lab. Today's lecture will simply be reviewing, preparing for the exam. Um, a reminder that the first 15 questions are simply graded if you have the answer right or if you have the answer wrong. The last five problems will be graded based on your work, your figure, your explanation. So on those last five, make sure that you include a figure unless it specifically says no figure necessary. And that figure should give a figure that helps to solve the problem. The, uh, the concept should be laid out, you know, explain how you're going to solve the problem, what your ideas of how things should fit together work or are, and then show your understanding in your work. Make sure you show equations without numbers in them and then put the numbers in as appropriate for solving. And don't take a special case equation. That is, I pretty much give you all of the equations you need. Don't take an equation that's not on those and say, oh, this one here, I'm gonna apply. Because you know, an equation that only works, for instance, one of the ones that bugs me is the range equation for a trajectory that's valid only if it starts and ends at the same elevation. Right, I don't put that on the equation sheet because it's a special case. And when people use it, then I get annoyed because I want to see them use physics, not just see them put numbers into an equation. And so that's the reason I don't want the special case. I want to see the reasoning, the thought process. So again, right off the bat, chapter nine, we were studying equilibrium. Equilibrium, equal forces is the technical meaning there, but equilibrium has two conditions. One is translational or linear, that you have the net force is zero or an acceleration of zero. What does that tell you about the velocity? It's constant. We often think, oh, velocity is zero for equilibrium. And zero velocity is in equilibrium, but so is a constant velocity. So if you're driving down the road, going straight north at 35 miles an hour, you're gonna get nowhere, but it would be constant velocity, hence it'd be in equilibrium. The second condition is the rotational equivalent, the net torque is zero. And the rotational equivalent to Newton's second law is the net torque is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So an angular acceleration of zero is also equilibrium. That means it can be rotating, but it can't be changing its rate of rotation. So you have those two conditions for equilibrium. We had torque introduced here, and we had torque is a vector. Notice that's a tau. It's not a capital T. It's a tau. Greek letter is equal to R cross F. Now, you'll be given that equation on the test, but it's a little important to know how to use it. So let's first just make sure we know what each symbol means. So what is tau? Torque. Why is there an arrow over it? It's a vector. It has a direction. What is R? Okay, now we say radius. I don't remember who it is, but somebody was asking, you know, why, why do we have radius there? The radius of what? What it's not is the radius of a circle. So, so Brandon, you had an answer? Okay, now I'm sure if Brandon were writing down and using it, he would have it correct because his words sound like he knows what he's talking about here. <laughs> no, it does. It, there's a difference in, in having a clear explanation and knowing what you're talking about. Something that my students often say about me. Right? <laughs> yes, I said that. I wasn't joking, sadly. The radius there is more technically called the lever arm. And it's the vector that points from the location you're summing the torque to the location where the force acts. So that R vector is the lever arm. We call it the radius. After all, we use the symbol R. But it's important to know what it means. It's not like, oh, it's the radius of a circle. That would be a different thing. And you have to know how to draw it, what direction it goes, or you're you know, going to likely make some horrendous mistakes in applying it. Finally, F is force. I won't, you know, I won't ask you, what does F again? 
F is the force applied. Now, what does the cross mean there in between? You're multiplying the perpendicular parts. If I put the equation like this, what would that mean? Just multiplying. So there is a very different meaning in what's written here. This is a completely wrong equation that I have written now. And this equation here. The meaning is completely different, right? So it's not a valid substitute to just write it without the vector signs. Now in your textbook, they use bold font instead of the vector signs. The bold font means a vector as well. But when we're writing by hand, most of us don't have the ability to make a clearly bold letter. So that's why we use the vector sign. Okay, finally, this cross product has both a magnitude and a direction, right? The answer is a vector. We sometimes call this a vector product. It's a vector multiplication that gives you a product that's a vector. And so we find the direction using the right hand rule and we find the magnitude well, in a simpler fashion, we find the magnitude by simply multiplying the perpendicular parts. So if I have two vectors like A and B here, if I want to find the magnitude, I need to find the perpendicular parts. So I'll find the angle between the two. So I have one is like this. One is like this. This angle here was 20 degrees. This angle here was 30 degrees. So what's the angle between the two? Okay, 30 minus 20 is, and that was supposed to be in the green pin. Whoops, to me back. So that's 10 degrees because it's 30 minus 20. And so if I take those, I can find what portion is perpendicular just by saying, okay, Let's make our coordinate system so our coordinate system is like this. And how much of that blue vector is parallel to my green? Well, it's just going to be, or excuse me, perpendicular. It's just going to be the opposite side here. So the trigonometric function that relates opposite and hypotenuse is sine. So the magnitude is just going to be the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times sine of the angle between the two. So in this case, that would be 5.0 units times 3.0 units times sine of 10 degrees. Now I put numbers in here because students generally like to see numbers. I'm not even gonna worry about putting it in a calculator because it's a meaningless answer, right? It's just a contrived so we can see how it works. So that's how we get the magnitude. How do we get the direction? Okay, counterclockwise and clockwise works. If we take that, how do we know if it's going to be counterclockwise or clockwise? Right, I, I didn't define like force and radius. I did it in generic form. So the, the clockwise, counterclockwise rule doesn't actually work if it's in generic form. So we have to do what Corso said, use the right hand rule. So you take your right hand and point your index finger of your right hand in the direction of the first item in the cross product. So this was A cross B. So I'm going to take my index finger of my right hand and point in the direction of A, which is the red arrow. And then keeping that index finger pointing the same direction, I need to rotate my hand so I can bend my finger toward my palm until it reaches B, the blue vector. So since B is going that way, I'm going to have to rotate my hand this way so I can bend my fingers up there. And then my thumb comes out. And so the direction of A cross B is coming out of the screen. Notice A and B don't have to be perpendicular. They're not perpendicular here. They're only 10 degrees away from each other. But there is a perpendicular component, and that rule gives me a direction that's coming out of the screen. Now, for directions, the x direction cross the y direction is equal to the z direction. And so x cross y, just using my coordinate system, x cross y, the z is coming out of the screen. I'm doing it from my screen, so that's why my thumb's going in. 
So that means the direction we just found was out of the screen. So that's in the Z direction. And so it's 15 units squared sine of 10 degrees in the Z direction is the answer for A cross B. Would my answer be the same or different if I did B cross A? Okay, we have two pieces. Would the magnitude change if I did B cross A? No, because I did perpendicular components. Doesn't matter the order of the perpendicular components are going to have the same magnitudes. But the direction does change because if I use the right-hand rule for B cross A, I point my index finger in the direction of B, the direction of blue, and now I need to orient my hand so I can point my middle fingers in the direction of the red, and that's down below, so I have to have it like this. My thumb goes in. And so B cross A is the opposite direction from A cross B. Now, I spent a lot of time on this because this is a concept that's going to come back again. It's not just torque that uses a cross product in physics. So we need to learn it for now and for the future. Now, the last two parts, know the conditions for stable, unstable, neutral equilibrium. Stable equilibrium, if you take something that's in equilibrium and you move it away from its equilibrium position, it will return. So if I have a bowl with a marble in it, the equilibrium for the marble is the lowest available potential energy state at the bottom of the cup. If I pull it up a little bit on one side and I let go, it's going to go back and oscillate through the bottom of the cup until eventually friction removes energy and it stops at the bottom. So it came back to equilibrium. That's stable. Neutral is like if I have the marble on the table. If I take the marble and I pick it up and I move it over here and let go, it's just going to be stable in a new position. That's neutral equilibrium. And then finally, unstable would be if I have a marble on top of a dome. If it's on the very center, it'll balance. If I move it off to the side, it's just going to roll away. It won't come back to equilibrium. That's unstable. So that's what this bottom one is. Being able to solve a problem, here is... A nice good problem one that I put on tests in the past NFL rules specify that football goalposts are 18 and a half feet apart and the crossbar is 10 feet off the ground the goalposts are supported by a single standard gooseneck that places post two yards in front of the single support a single standard is buried 53 inches what horizontal what additional horizontal force must the bottom of the hole supply to counter a 95 kilogram fan standing in the crossbar at one of the two posts Treat the ground as if it supplies one horizontal and one vertical force. How would you solve that problem? Okay, step number one, draw a picture. So I drew pictures here. I drew two pictures because I really need both pictures to solve it. One that's looking at it from the side and one that's looking at it from the front. Notice I put my coordinate systems and one has XZ. One has YZ because they're rotated by nine degrees from each other. So I drew my picture. What do I need to add to this picture? Forces. Why? How does she know I need to add forces? Because what? Because <laughs> we did it from the last test. Well, it starts with identifying the concept. Now. This is already given to you, and it's an equilibrium problem. You would identify, oh, this is an equilibrium problem because the rate of rotation of the goalpost should not change. It shouldn't go from stationary to non-stationary. That would be bad. After the Cougs win the Apple Cup, it usually goes from stationary to non-stationary. One year, the goalposts ended outside of the Coug, which was a bar. They dragged them out of the stadium down the road to the bar and left them outside the bar. Um, because that's how students celebrate. I don't know if you guys saw this last weekend. Wazoo made the news. Go Cougs. After we scored a touchdown, some crazy drunk student jumped onto the field and 
dropped his shorts to, you know, show <laughs> off to the world, I suppose. That's my coot. <laughs> my brothers. Uh, anyway. <laughs> okay. So because I identify it's an equilibrium, then my concept will be it's an equilibrium because the rotation is not changing and it's not changing velocity. It's an equilibrium. If it's an equilibrium, then I have two equations. Some of the torques is zero, some of the force is zero. So I'm going to have my concept in equilibrium. That's supposed to be a Q. <clears throat> because omega equals zero and V equals zero are both constant. So apply equilibrium conditions. And solve. Like duh, no, just apply the equilibrium conditions and run away. Then I have my equations. If it's an equilibrium, I said we have two equations. Some of the torque vectors is zero. Some of the force vectors is zero. And then I need to have my equation for what torque is. Torque is equal to R cross F. Those are all the equations I need. At this point, I'm not going to say, oh, you have to put force of gravity as mg. I'm going to go ahead and let you say that one's just an assumed equation now. So now I get to the solve part, and because I'm using Newton's second law, and I'm using that sum of the torques equation, those both require that I show the forces. Newton's second law, that's where we have the free body diagram that technically has all the forces acting on one point. But if we're doing some of the torques, we need to show a force diagram with the forces where they're actually acting. So I'm going to come back to the picture and notice one more subtlety. The problem said, what additional horizontal force must the bottom supply? So since I'm doing the additional, I'm going to treat the goalposts as if they have no mass. Because that's already taken into account. I'm just counting the additional. So I'm only going to show the force that's associated with this guy having mass and then the additional forces it causes. So going in that direction, what force does this person standing on the crossbars produce? Okay, a force of gravity pointing down. Okay, that was a poor choice of color because I've already used it. Green is a better choice. Now what? Yeah, I'm not worried about the numbers at this point. I mean, yes. We have that additional force of the person on there, which is going to require the ground to make an additional upward force, which I'm just going to call force up. That's additional. And it would naturally rotate because of him standing there. So the ground is going to have to make forces to counter the rotation. And those two forces are going to be Force bottom, force top. Force the top is the force where the goalpost goes into the ground. Force bottom is the horizontal force at the bottom. So those are all the additional forces that I need there to keep it from rotating. Now I'm going <laughs> to notice this is in the x direction. So I'm going to put force top x, force bottom x. Now I need to do some work. Which equation would be the easiest one to use if I want to find force Bx? We had the two options, some of the force is zero and some of the torques is zero. Okay, torques is the correct answer. The reason torques is the correct answer is there are two horizontal forces. I don't know either of them. So how can I find one without, without knowing either? Well, I'll just choose to name this location A and sum the torques 
about A, in which direction? Well, X is horizontal, Z is vertical. What's the direction perpendicular to both X and Z? Y. So I'm going to sum these about the Y direction or about A in the Y direction. So if I sum the torques about A in the Y direction, why did I choose A? The force TX will make zero torque because it's pointing right at A. And the force up will make zero torque because it's also pointing right at A. So when I do the sum of the torques, I'm going to have force tension or top X times zero because that's the perpendicular distance plus force up times zero because that's the perpendicular distance. Uh, then I have my next one. I have the force of gravity. The force of gravity is going to make this rotate which direction? Okay, as viewed in this picture, it'll go clockwise, which means that the torque is, well, it's into the picture, but since X cross Y equals Z, it turns out Z cross X equals Y. So Z, Z cross X is equal to Y. Y is actually going into the screen in this picture. And so it's actually in the negative Y direction, right? This one didn't follow our standard that clockwise is negative and counterclockwise is positive because of the directions I had assigned for X and Z. So you have to pay attention. You know, if you define X and Z and you're doing it in the Y, then that's going to be negative force gravity. And then what's the perpendicular distance you can read in my picture? What's the perpendicular distance from A to where the force of gravity is acting? Two meters I, or two yards. I'm just going to put X for now because I put that variable as X. So I'm calling it X. And then the final force, force BX, R is down, force is, okay, go in here. R is down, the force is that direction, thumb comes out. Wait, wait. I got to make sure I get it, that's right. In was positive, I wrote negative here after explaining why it was positive. That's where my problem is. So the last one is negative force BX times, and that's 53.0 inches. What's the sum of the torques equal to? And so now we can just solve this for force BX is equal to force G times that X over 53.0 inches equals 95 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times now it's two yards the bottom is in inches the top is in yards so let's convert that to inches can we do that in our head 36 inches for one yard this is two yards so that's 72 inches the little double quote means inch and so we have 95 times 9.8 times 72 divided by 53 equals 1265 newtons. Now, how many significant digits do I have? Two. But I'm not to the end of the problem yet, so I don't just take that to 1,300 and quit because that's only the X component. I also have to look at the Y component. So here I have the problem looking from the front. I'm not going to take the time, but you would do the problem again to find, you know, using the dimensions here, what the additional Y component is going to be. You would have to put in your forces. You would have – 
forces like that and of course the the same force up and some of the torques again about this location it works you know same type of math to get you the other force once I have those two forces, how do I find the answer to the problem? Well, once I have the number for force bottom X and force bottom Y. How do I get the magnitude of that force? I use the Pythagorean theorem because the X and Y directions are mutually perpendicular. So the hypotenuse has a magnitude. Hypotenuse squared is equal to X squared plus Y squared. So that's an example of solving an equilibrium problem. Any equilibrium problem is going to start with the same concept and equations pretty much. And then you have to decide, is this going to be easiest to sum the forces or sum the torques? Usually sum the torques because if you choose the right location, you can make an unknown force disappear. So then you identify where you're going to sum the torques. Sometimes you have to sum the torques more than once. Sometimes you have to sum the forces as well as sum the torques. That depends on the problem. Chapter 9. Going to Chapter 10. I know I spent too much time on Chapter 9. Know the rotational dynamics quantities. So rotational dynamics quantities, instead of distance, we have angle. Instead of velocity, we have angular velocity. Instead of tangential acceleration, we have the angular acceleration. And make sure you can relate those two, right? It's very simple. We had some of that for the last test because we introduced it when we talked about um, centripetal force. But, you know, basically V tangential is equal to omega times the radius. A tangential is alpha times the radius, right? They're, they're simple conversions. Kinematic equations for rotation are the same as kinematic equations for linear motion just changing from V to omega, from A to alpha, from X to theta. So you should be able to do those. Um, I have some examples of rotational dynamics problems. You actually have this problem as a homework problem, right? So I'm actually going to save some time and not do that. Instead, do this. A yo-yo can be treated like a solid cylinder rotating about symmetry axis. When the yo-yo leaves a person's hand, the string is wound up so it unwinds at a radius of about nine-tenths the yo-yo's full radius. When it nears the bottom of the string, it un unwinds at a radius of about one-fifth the yo-yo's full radius. What's the acceleration at the top and at the bottom? What's the first thing you should do? Draw a picture. So I drew a picture. I defined my coordinate directions. I drew the string. I drew my yo-yo and drew where the string is attached. Probably should have put another circle here to show, yes, the string is unrolling on that. That was a perfect circle, as you can tell. It's also not disappearing. Well, that'll make it disappear. That's a better circle. So I drew a picture. What next? Okay. I think I heard concept among the things that were said. Let's identify the concept. Is this an equilibrium problem? No. How do you know it's not? It's accelerating. Exactly. It's accelerating and it has rotational acceleration. So that's not equilibrium. So that means it's a rotational dynamics problem. And so we're going to have to... Combine rotational dynamics and linear dynamics to solve for acceleration. Acceleration, right, says acceleration, that's a linear variable. So that's how I know I'm going to have to use linear dynamics in some fashion because I have a linear variable. So what are e our equations associated with these? Alpha 
which is the tangential acceleration over radius. We also have the sum of the torque vectors is equal to I alpha vector. The sum of the force vectors is equal to MA vector. <coughs> so I'm going to use these equations to solve. Now looking at these equations, one of them I have is Newton's second law, and one of them I have is the rotational equivalent. That tells me in no uncertain terms, I need to identify the forces acting on my object of interest. Now, the last problem, I didn't specify carefully what my object of interest was. It was pretty simple. It had to be the goalpost. And this one's also pretty simple. What's the object of interest? The yo-yo. So I'm going to look at all the forces acting on the yo-yo. So name them. Gravity. Gravity. What direction does that act? Down. Yeah. Okay. That, that should always be a gimme at this point. Force of gravity is mg downward. What other force or forces are acting on the yo-yo? The what? Tension. tension. In what direction is the tension acting? Okay, I would have accepted two answers. It's acting upward or it's acting in the direction the string is leaving the yo-yo, which is upward. Right, the second one was more clear on why. The first one was more clear on what that direction actually is. Those are my only forces. <sighs> Now what do I do? Let's say I don't know what I do. If I don't know what I do, I've already identified the equations. It's the old idea of throw the spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. So I will do, my forces are both in the vertical direction. So I can do some of the forces in the Z direction is equal to mass times the acceleration in the Z direction, which is my only acceleration. So I look at that and I get what do I get when I do some of the forces looking at this picture? Okay, force tension is parallel to Z, so it's going to be plus force tension. Force of gravity is anti-parallel, minus force of gravity is equal to mass times AZ. Now, it didn't tell me what the mass of the yo-yo was. I don't know what the force of tension is. I'm not done. I can replace this with force of tension minus mg equals maz, but that's as far as I can go. So that was one equation. What's the other equation? Sum of torques is I alpha. Sum of the torques, okay, I've got the x direction, the z direction. What direction are the torques in this problem? Okay, they're about the y axis. So I can sum the torques about the y-axis. Where should I sum the torques? You always have to choose where you're going to sum the torques. Okay, I heard where it moves, and I heard I have a question. Go ahead and so ask your question. So where is the y-axis? Because there's only a z. Okay, so remember I said x cross y is z? So you can permute them. That is, you can shift over y cross z is x, and z cross x is y. And so if we take Z up cross X, Y is going into the board or into the stream. Now, I, I haven't pushed that on you because it's a convention. It's not an absolute necessity. Right? You could, for instance, make a left-hand coordinate system. We don't like to use left-hand coordinate systems, but you could. And if you used a left-hand coordinate system, Y would be coming out. So some of the torques about the y-axis. Somebody said to do it about the center. I want to do it about the center because, well, that's where I consider the yo-yo rotating around. And if it's rotating about the center, then the moment of inertia is a simple equation that we are given. And so I'm doing it about the center. And it's I alpha. So I look at the forces acting on it. There are two forces, so my torques are going to be two torques. One is going to be force of gravity times, what's the distance from the center to where the force of gravity acts? From the center to where the force of gravity acts. 
the force of gravity acts at the center. So the distance from the center to where the force of gravity acts is zero. And then for the next one, my radius is going that way, or that way, excuse me. The force is up. So the right-hand rule, it's going into the board or parallel to the y-axis, so it's going to be positive. And that's acting at a perpendicular distance of RS. So this is an equation. I can simplify it to say force tension times RS is equal to the moment of inertia, which is one half mass times the radius of the yo-yo squared. So that's I in parentheses and then alpha. Now, if you look at this, what's unknown? Well, the M is still unknown. The force tension is unknown and alpha is unknown. And you're like, wow, I don't think he's going the right direction. Is that what you're thinking? And of course, I being the teacher, am actually going in the right direction. I put these in here because, well, there are the equations I have. There's one more equation that I wrote down. Alpha is equal to A tangential over R. Now, if I have a positive angular acceleration, Based on a right-hand rule here, the y direction is into the screen. So that's going to be a rotation that goes like this. If it rotates like this, what direction is the linear acceleration? What direction is the yo-yo going to accelerate if it's rotating like this on that string? It's going to go down, which is the negative z direction. So taking this equation and applying our directions, I'm going to get alpha equals minus AZ over the radius of the spool. Why the radius of the spool? Because that's where the string is coming off of. And so the upward acceleration of the string at the points coming off is the same as the downward acceleration of the center of mass. So this gives me a relation to relate those so let's just put this in right there. Force tension times radius of the spool is equal to one half mass times radius of the yo-yo squared times negative AZ over R spool, which means that force tension is equal to one half mass times radius Y squared over radius S squared times minus AZ. Notice I combined those two R's I divided. So there's my force of tension. I will take this force of tension and plug it in. Yeah. So that's going to be, I'm going to shrink this down so I can see everything at once minus one half mass radius yo-yo squared over radius of spool squared az minus mg equals maz now what's the first step before i solve it divide out the m Mass of the yo-yo did not matter to this problem. It wasn't given, and a lot of times people say, I don't have a fundamental number that's necessary to solve. But because it canceled, I didn't need that fundamental number. Now I need to combine my AZs. So I'm going to move this over by adding. And I will have minus G equals AZ plus ry squared over 2rs squared. One plus, yeah. Yeah, factoring out the az, that was a... So finally, my answer is going to be az is equal to minus g 
divided by one plus one half of ry over rs quantity squared. That was a lot of work. But now all I have to do is put in the value of rs initial, which was, I believe, nine tenths, and rs final, which was one fifth, both fractions of r yo yo. And I can calculate the acceleration that it starts with and the acceleration it ends with. Now, I actually put this question on a test, and you know what most people answered? They said it's just accelerating downward with an acceleration of g. Well, why is it not accelerating downward with an acceleration of g? You have that string pulling up on it. It's not in free fall. And so the acceleration downward is going to be less than g because that string is pulling up. And the acceleration changes as you get the string off of the yo-yo because you're pulling up closer to the axis. And that's producing less torque. Okay, so I'm because I only have five minutes left, I'm not going to put the numbers in there. Just going to leave it at that. Chapters 11 and 12, we're dealing with fluids. So make sure you understand what the fundamental states of matter are and can identify if something's liquid, solid, etc. And know what pressure is. Hydrostatic pressure means that it's in a fluid and it's not changing. The hydrostatic pressure is force divided by area. And if you're in a fluid, of course, we learned that it's well, the pressure is the result of the weight of everything above. The change in pressure is the density of the fluid times G times the change in elevation. We had Pascal's principle and Archimedes principles. I'm going to do one last example here. I say one last because there's only four minutes that deals with Archimedes principle. Be sure you can understand how surface tension works. Explain what direction the force is, why it's called tension, those kinds of ideas. Let's go to this problem before time ends. The density of seawater is 1,025 kilograms per meter cube, while density of ice is 934 kilograms per meter cube. What fraction of an iceberg is above water? Let's start with the concept. What's our concept here? Okay, less dense things float. I want to go a little bit more. That's in the right direction. That's what I was looking for. Whoops. I got I got to lower it and change color so it doesn't look like it's continuing the last one. Along with one other idea, this iceberg is in equilibrium. Iceberg, a nice. Plus. Okay, so now I go to my equations. Force buoyant is equal to the density of the fluid times the volume displaced times G. Now I'm going to for, put force of gravity is equal to MG equals density of the object times volume of the object times G because the mass is density times volume. So that has the implied mass equal to density times volume. And it's an equilibrium, so some of the forces is equal to zero. Now I only have the sum of the forces because there's no rate rotational issues involved. So I look at this picture and I say, aha, I got Newton's second law. There's some of the forces. So I better show the forces, force of gravity downward, force buoyant upward. Let's consider this the Y direction for grins. And I'm going to have Force buoyant minus force of gravity equals zero. Therefore, substituting in for force buoyant and force gravity.
Notice we have something in both terms. G, so we cancel that out. And then I'm just going to solve for the volume displaced divided by the volume of the object. So I had to move this to the other side to make it positive. And then I'm going to divide everything by density of the fluid volume of the object. So that's the density of the object over density of the fluid. And so now I have the ratio that is below water because volume displaced divided by volume of object is the volume that's, or the percentage that's below water. So that's what, 935, 934 divided by 1025. And just because I'm really curious. That's 0 0.9112. So 91.12% of the iceberg is below water. How much is above water? 8.88% is above water. So that's how we calculate 8.88%. Kind of cool, right? And that one was really quick, but the concept, I had to use two concepts. It's in equilibrium and that the buoyant force is equal to the weight displaced. Okay, I'm out of time. So make sure you look over um, the chapter 12 there, Bernoulli's equation, how laminar flow works, Poiseuille's equation.